And the topic this morning is, have you not read the Jesus hermeneutic for the understanding of the Genesis narrative? A hermeneutic is a method of uh, reading scripture or any document, understanding what's the intent uh, so that the reader can fully or best understand the intent of the writer. Here we are. Now, I understand that there is a great erosion in the respect that Christian scholars have for the text. One of my great teachers, David Flusser, said many, many years ago to uh, one of his classes, he said, we as Jews are going to have to defend Jesus from Christian theologians. <laughs> and it's true. We already have to do it. Uh, there, is, there is books that have been written every couple of months, another book comes down by Jewish rabbis defending Jesus, trusting the words of Jesus more than the Christians do. I'm a graduate of Pepperdine University, 1967, and I have spent 63 years of my life in non-instrument churches of Christ, and I've enjoyed all of those years. They've been a wonderful experience for me with wonderful relationships, with wonderful people, uh, uh, driven by a desire to serve and honor God and His Son, the Lord Jesus. And uh, I've had a life that's been just wonderfully blessed. For me, uh, the question of instrumental music, uh, I understand how some people could have a, a desire to just honor Scripture by not using music uh, for worship. But... I think for most people in the Church of Christ, especially today, that's this kind of down at a kind of a noise level of things that, uh, that drive decisions, but, but it's still honored because people desire to honor uh, the consciences of people around them and focus on the major issues, not the minor issues. But uh, last year when I came to the uh, Pepperdine Bible Lectures, uh, I was just uh, saddened, uh, just deeply saddened. Uh, that the uh, lectures by several of the professors on staff at the Bible lectures uh, seem to, well, they just, Adam and Eve were not real people, there was no global flood, we really cannot take the, the, uh, the Bible literally. Um, and that's just, to me, it, it was very saddening. So it comes to a decision like this. What are the major issues that you deal with in your life, in your fellowship, um, and what are the ones that you deal with secondarily or somewhere down the line? And as I understand it, all of our Christian faith, all of our hope, all of our redemption is based on our understanding of, of the Genesis narrative, that God created, therefore he has the authority to give us a moral law, and he has the power to uh, uh, redeem us and the power to give us eternal life. If those things are not true, I've wasted a lot of my life just going up a rabbit trail. And I, I, I don't believe that's happened. This picture is kind of designed to, to show this question. On the left side, you see a monkey holding a pitch pipe. There's a very serious point here. Uh, it's not intended to be in offensive, but it is absolutely intended to say it's really something that churches need to look at. Are we, are we uh, majoring in minors and minoring in majors? On the right side, you see someone with a calliope, if you've ever heard of calliope. And the question uh, posed on this slide should this choice be difficult? In one case, you have a Church of Christ college teacher with a pitch pipe and a simian genealogy. It means uh, He says he comes from monkeys, which is not biblical. On the right side, it might be any, any kind of a, of a preacher that's preaching fundamental basics of the Bible um, and playing whatever kind of music or just something that's not, not a major item, but in fact... Uh, this person is teaching the biblical narrative of creation of man and woman made in the image of God, uh, the fall of man, bringing uh, sin and bringing death into the world, and uh, then the flood, bringing God's judgment upon a very evil world and producing all the fossils in the process. So the question I've posed at the bottom of this slide, is it outrageous to apply one particular rigorous hermeneutic to preclude instruments in worship, while at the same time uh, to ignore the hermeneutic used by Jesus, have you not read? And in that he affirmed very clearly the readability of the Genesis narrative to the leaders, to the Jewish leaders of his time. 
And so, uh, to me, this is a no-brainer, and it should be for anyone in any church, whether in the Churches of Christ, whether it's an is issue of instrumental music, or if it's a question of uh, uh, how you take communion, or a question of where you assign your seats in the church. Um, we have to begin with first points, and that is that when Jesus said, have you not read, he was very clearly affirming the accuracy, the authority, the readability, the understandability of the Genesis narrative as written in the Hebrew language, as read by Jesus and by the scholars of his time, and therefore by people today. Here's the point. It's interesting. Uh, I saw this quotation, and it just really struck me. It was, it was quoted by Carl Wieland, um, a, a fellow who's a creationist uh, down under. I don't know if his Carl is from Australia or New Zealand, Australia, I believe. And he um, had a sit-down cup of coffee with uh, a very high-powered Christian leader in Australia who was teaching uh, evolution, theistic evolution, saying, well, sure, there's evolution, but, but God did it, so we can match it up with the Bible. And uh, Carl asked him this question. What about when Jesus said, uh, have you not read? Jesus was affirming the book of, uh, of, the, the book of Genesis in the narrative. And he thought he would get some kind of weasel words. You can find this written up... Um, I don't have it here on this slide, but it was uh, written up in a creation magazine a couple of years ago, I think. And the fellow's reply was actually uh, very transparent. He didn't try to hide his theology. He just said, well, Jesus didn't know as much science as we know today. And uh, Carl Whelan expressed that it, just, it shook him to the core to hear that spoken so bluntly. But if we kind of scratch under the surface and look at the Christian theologians today who say, who just ignore the, the hermeneutic that Jesus demonstrated to us, um, saying that the book of Genesis is readable and understandable. Honesty at the very core really demands this same kind of an answer, and that is a diminishing of the understanding that Jesus had of Scripture, the diminishing of Jesus as creator, the diminishing of the, of the majestic Christology of Jesus described in Colossians chapter 1, where is the image of the invisible God, the being the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were made that are in heaven and in earth. And uh, it has to deny all of those things, this major text of Christology and all of the other uh, texts in the Bible that really make it clear that he was not just um, uh, an elevated man, but he was God the divine who put on, who put on human flesh, limiting himself uh, to serve us. So why did this uh, scholar say this? The answer was theistic evolution. That was what he chose as his view of the world, his view of scripture. Why did he say it? Because, uh, well, he, he just didn't agree uh, that Jesus really understood. He was denying the accuracy, the readability, and the authority of the Old Testament scripture and the Genesis narrative. Uh, to me, that's a tragedy. Carl Whelan saw it that way uh, when I saw it in print. I felt the same way. And I think people who really honor Jesus as truly Lord, truly Savior, truly God in man, uh, would also grieve at these kinds of words. So we should also grieve at Christian teachers in universities, in Christian schools, in our churches, in our pulpits, that also would, when you scratch underneath the surface, would promote an idea that really has this same attitude of who Jesus was as he walked in the flesh. And Jesus gave truth tests. I'll just mention this one, but this is what I would call the diamond truth test. It's the ultimate truth test. Jesus said this to those who were questioning him. Oh, you say you're, you're son of God. How can you say that? In John chapter 10, verses 37, 38, Jesus said, don't believe me unless I do what my father does. That's perfect, isn't it? Uh, that's a very precise. It's, it's an, it, to a mathematician who, who heard this, is that is an elegant test. It's precise. He says, but if I, if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I'm, and I'm in the father. In the 2014 Bible lectures at Pepperdine University, which is my alma mater and one of the motivations for beginning the creation literacy uh, program. One of the speakers was a, um, a Old Testament scholar who said, well, how can I compromise? How, how no, well, 
he didn't say compromise. Probably he said reconcile. Uh, in my understanding, my interpretation, compromise is the correct word, but the reconcile is the word I think that was used. How can I reconcile the Old Testament uh, words uh, with the modern prevailing uh, understanding of science of origins, meaning evolution? They said, well, the answer is kenosis, which is the, which is the Greek word for translated as emptying or to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, where it says uh, Jesus emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Uh, there's one translation, I think maybe the NIV says he made himself nothing, which I think is really a very poor translation. Because um, with the interpretation of kenosis that this scholar had last year, it's the idea that Jesus emptied himself of, of aspects of doing it, as taking it out. Uh, that he, didn't, he wasn't walking around with the knowledge of God, with the power of God, with, uh, with the authority of God. But in fact, if you read that text carefully, how did he empty himself? He didn't empty himself by taking every, all of the divine out. He emptied himself by putting humanity on. In other words, uh, like a, a world-class athlete may limit himself by putting on 200 pounds of armor. Uh, it's the same person inside, uh, but there are limitations. Jesus purposely limited himself, so that was the kenosis. He was still... He was still God, the Son of God, walking the flesh, and therefore he had the authority of divinity because he was, in fact, divinity. I'm not a theologian. I'm an engineer. But I've been reading Scripture a long time, and uh, to me, the whole question of kenosis and emptying himself was, was emptying himself of the authority to use his power for his own benefit. So he could feed, he could feed 5,000 with a boy's small lunch, uh, but he couldn't use his divine authority for his own comfort to turn stones to bread. Um, so, now here's the text in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, I'll just look at verse 16. For by him all, th this is speaking of Jesus, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. The theologian in Australia who said, well, maybe uh, Jesus probably didn't know as much science as we know, he certainly had a diminished view of the Jesus uh, that I know, and certainly not a biblical view of Jesus. This is who Jesus was. This is who Jesus is. The creator understanding every detail of the creation. And maybe before I go on, there are many examples. For example, Jesus' knowledge of things past. Who among the leaders of the Jews of his time would understand the answer, why did God permit divorce in the Old Testament? The Old Testament didn't say why. Jesus knew the answer. He said, from the beginning it was not so. And by the way, there's another text where it gives the beginning. Jesus absolutely refers to the beginning. He says, from the beginning it was not so. Uh, for God made the male and female. Jesus also, he, he demonstrated supernatural knowledge as divine knowledge when he explained to the Jewish leaders something that was not revealed in Scripture, and that was the reason God permitted divorce. It was for the hardness of heart. Uh, that is, it was for the benefit of the woman to reduce the suffering that the hardness of heart of man could, um, could put upon women in their relationships. That wasn't in Scripture, but Jesus knew it because Jesus knew the mind of God because he was, in fact, God walking in the flesh among us. And we find many examples like that. So... The idea of kenosis, meaning that emptied himself to become Jesus and just took out everything and became uh, something, some person that was impotent but a very fine teacher, is just simply not biblical. Uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about a few um, uh, theistic evolutionists and progressive creationists. I'll mention Hugh Ross. I think his teachings are used at uh, many Christian universities and colleges around the country that would still be fairly conservative. But Hugh Ross really uh, does not follow many of the elements clearly in the book of Genesis. Just to mention one, the flood. Uh, he would say that the flood was local. There were a variety of other things. And there's an excellent book written by uh, Jonathan Sarfati on that to answer many of those questions. I had an opportunity to uh, ask a question standing first in line in a Q&A when Hugh Ross uh, appeared at a talk in Portland about 10 years ago, and I asked him, this may sound a little esoteric, 
ask, I ask him a question about the, uh, the diffusion rate of helium in zircons. That may seem uh, way out there somewhere, but it has a great deal to do with understanding the, uh, the strong evidence that there was an accelerated rate of decay in, uh, in radioactive materials at some time in the past. A very powerful indication and that was proven by a test done by the Institute for Creation Research indicating a value that was predicted and the ICR using the basis as the Bible as a basis had the correct answer when the conventional answer would have been differing by five orders of magnitude that's by a factor of 100,000. His answer was well why would they choose something slippery like helium? The reason they chose helium was because number one it is, sleep, it is slippery means it's a very small atom that uh, can, can travel through uh, crystal in rock, uh, but also that was the one that was in question. He went on a five-minute rant, uh, which kind of surprised me. I'd, I'd heard about theistic evolutionists and so on before. I put, on, I put that whole question on the shelf of my mind saying, wait and see, as I tend to do with a lot of things, wait and see, and time will tell. When I heard his five-minute rant, I realized, Okay, what I've been hearing from the creationists was exactly correct. It was precise. So now I understand. I waited. I saw. Now I understand. Uh, he, he's, he, he was an ideologue rather than really uh, truly desiring to seek science and true science to reconcile scripture. Uh, Phil Smith. Uh, this was about the first week in April of 2014. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it was January. Uh, in, this was uh, in January 2014 in a debate between a local atheist in Portland and uh, Professor Phil Smith, who is a Christian educator at George Fox University, uh, which is a, a Christian university in, uh, near Portland, Oregon. And uh, the atheist was asking him about the flood. Do you, think the, do you think the flood story was real? His answer, no, I, I think it's a myth. The atheist said, well, why? Why, why, why do you take that position? Phil Smith's answer was, well, I don't know, not enough water? I think the point here is that Christian educators really need to be the best informed, not the most poorly informed. For a question like that, uh, the answer is, you know, um, I could check that really quickly by Googling how much, if it's all of the Earth's surface is covered by water, what's that come out to be? 1.9 miles depth. There's just a lot of misinformation, incorrect information, assumptions by Christian theologians, and um, it's our job to help them become literate scientifically, not with lies, but in fact with facts. And that's really what's at issue. Um, another uh, is uh, Chris Duran, a uh, uh, professor at Pepperdine University, my alma mater, in the year 2014, the Bible lectures. He said this, meaning and purpose are philosophical conundrums that have faced humankind for 40 or 50,000 years. As soon as we started looking up into the sky and had metaphors and symbols to be able to talk about the divine, we started asking those sorts of questions. I, I didn't know what to think when I heard that. Well, I didn't know what to think, but there were so many th thoughts. I guess the first reaction was just, just grief to understand that there were young people being taught this by a professor. And then Professor Duran also mentioned that he not only worked with students, he was working with churches. And, I, and this is simply so contrary to Scripture, it's, it's grievous. I mean, we should be weeping, we should be repenting, we should be crying, uh, crying out to God uh, in repentance that these kinds of things are being taught to our children, being taught to our churches, I guess I have a lot of sympathy with Chris Duran. He explained when he was a young guy just getting ready to go to college, he had questions about a lot of things. He said, there were many things I just wanted to understand. That's exactly where I was when I left high school, a lot of things I wanted to understand. Uh, we took different paths, but I, but I understand that desire to understand. But all of our seeking has to be subjected uh, to the authority of the Word of God, and which brings us back to the Jesus hermeneutic, that Jesus walking in the flesh shows, showed us his divinity and his authority. Also in the lectures, uh, Dr. Chris Hurd, an Old Testament scholar at Pepperdine University, uh, gave his understanding of kenosis as a, an emptying of, of Jesus, of, of divine power and attributes, not a putting on of limitations, uh, as an explanation for why 
theistic evolutionary point of view of Genesis could be accepted. Again, it's so contrary to many other things, you, you can't reconcile that view of Jesus uh, with so many other passages, especially the one we just read in Colossians chapter 1, and as well as all of the evidences that we find in the, in the Gospels, in the, the diamond test. Don't believe me unless I do the things that the Father does. Rodney Honeycutt, uh, also a Pepperdine professor, in a uh, discussion session in one of Chris Duran's uh, lectures, there was a question asked by a Pepperdine alum asking for an example of, a, uh, of macroevolution, a transition from one kind to another. That is not something within a dog species, for example. Rodney Honeycutt, a biology professor at, uh, at Pepperdine, um, offered the whale evolution example. As, here's what he said. It's, 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 the whale is a beautiful example of macroevolution, a land animal to a whale. Another example, Nancy Murphy is a theologian at um, Fuller Theological Seminary, Los Angeles area. And she expressed not so long ago, she had heard before about people who believed the, a kind of a literal cr creation uh, event from the Bible. And she got, it's, it's kind of curious, but uh, later she realized it was tragic because it left young people thinking that they had to choose between the truth of evolution and scripture, and so young people would lose their faith. Uh, I think what happened was she assumed there was a truth to the evolution story, and that's really uh, not at all true. Uh, there's so much information, and more and more every day, uh, modern science reveals uh, evidence for the biblical record of creation. Uh, also at Fuller Seminary, they had a guest article about three years ago by Carl Guyberson. I don't know how to pronounce his name. It might be Giberson, Guyberson. But he wrote a guest article in, the, uh, in their uh, quarterly magazine, maybe uh, spring of 2011 or 12, something like that. And uh, his comment was, uh, we have this elegant example of the whale evolution. So therefore, he was decrying the... Um, the fact that a recent poll had shown that over the population of the United States, fewer people were favoring theistic evolution. Many more were favoring uh, a biblical view of creation, what, what he would call creationism. And it's okay with me, it's, but creationism is not an ism. It's a fact. It's a historical fact. And so he was decrying that money. Oh, with, despite all of the money that has been spent by, by BioLogos, uh, all that money spent, and, and we're, we're losing ground. Uh, he was grieving over it, and the specific example that he offered was the whale evolution. Well, um, we'll come back to the whale evolution, but first I want to mention just a number of evidences um, that we have to deal with in terms of the reality. What's the science really say? If you, peel, if you take an onion and you start peeling away the layers, here are, uh, here are the layers we have. But at the real center of a lot of the discussion is the question of deep time. So if you look at the bottom of this picture, it talks about millions of years. That's what's at the core of the controversy, deep time. If there's no deep time, then there's no theistic evolution. I think everyone understands that really, that's really where the rub comes. I'll just talk about the first one, uh, first at the top. Uh, there has been and continues to be a great deal of fraud being um, practiced by the evolutionary community. And some, in some cases, um, uh, maybe not purposely. And I, hopefully, with, with charity to those who name Jesus a Savior, um, perhaps naively, but thinking, oh, this is science, so I have, to, I, have to, I have to honor science as well as God. But frauds, for example, uh, Ernst Haeckel and his fraudulent drawings of embryos. Uh, the Piltdown Man, that fraud that was perpetrated for nearly 40 years that affected so much of the education system in England and around the world. Ah, what's the third one? Walking Whales. That was a fraud. And that fraud was revealed um, even as early as 2007. And there was a press release uh, in early April 2014 about three weeks before Professor Honeycutt at Pepperdine mentioned the walking whales as an example of macroevolution. 
when that kind of fraud is exposed, it should go around the world at warp speed. But that kind of news usually gets shuffled under the table, and the news that is favorable to evolution is what gets spread at warp speed. Geomagnetism, that is that the Earth's uh, magnetic field is decaying at a very measurable rate, and really the stories that have been told to say that the, uh, that the magnetic field can rebuild itself through some kind of, an, of a dynamo process, it just doesn't work. The math doesn't work. Review of the literature shows it doesn't work. And uh, so why is that story continuing to be spread? Uh, the presumptions about junk DNA and vestigial organs. Uh, there's a fellow named Ono, uh, Professor Ono, around uh, maybe the late 1970s, who coined the term junk DNA on the presumption that, recognizing that about 5% or some, some small fraction of the DNA was used to, uh, to sequence proteins, identifiable, the rest, they couldn't see any function for it. So there is a presumption that, well, if we don't understand what it's used for, then it must be useless. So it must be a vestige. It must be what's left over from all of the long ages past of evolution. Is stuff that was used in the past is kind of left over and it's just it's still there. Well, first of all, I'm not a life scientist, but I do understand stuff about physics. And there's this little problem of energy. The cell is so beautifully balanced you can't have an energy system putting energy into reproducing and duplicating proteins that are not being used. The energy budget just simply doesn't allow it. That's from an energy perspective. People can argue from many other perspectives as well, but it was just simply wrong. And increasingly over the last uh, 30 years, Ono's presumption of, um, of junk DNA that was useless has been shown increasingly to be false. And now there's basically a universal awe at the great complexity of, of the DNA, not just the part that's used to sequence proteins, but throughout the DNA, uh, multiply used segments for many different things, the micromanagers, things that are happening with the RNA, functioning segments into the cytoplasm, just throughout. It's amazing. But Ono's presumption was incorrect. But if you had read the Bible, you'd know God doesn't make junk. And so um, it's interesting. Fortunately, Francis Collins, uh, somewhat a believer in God in leading the uh, Human Genome Project, um, he, perhaps he was one of the voices that said, we really should sequence the entire genome. Because there were many voices saying, that's an expensive process. We should just be sequencing the part of the genome that we know is functional. But better heads prevailed, and so the entire genome was, was sequenced. And now we know so much more about it, we can see the awe and wonder that God has provided in, in the human genome. The idea of vestigial organs. A hundred years ago, the, the list of vestigial organs was, was probably a hundred, uh, probably 100 names long. That is, organs that are in the human body that are vestiges of some past use, but n of no use now. If you had read the Bible, 100 years ago, you would say, they're not useless. We just don't know yet what they're doing. So, for example, I probably would not have had my appendix taken out in 19, whatever it was, 1954, I think. Because, well, they were, I was in the hospital. They were doing some, uh, tonsils or something. So, oh, kidney. Oh, we'll just take out the appendix now. Just. So there were probably a lot of uh, unnecessary surgeries, uh, tonsils, appendix, other things until the uses for almost all of these things have now been understood. Uh, some are problems. Tonsils get infected. So I had mine removed about um, three days after I graduated from Pepperdine um, out in the hospital out in West Los Angeles. But they're not vestigial. That is, they're not leftovers. They had an original function and still some function there. What about fresh uh, original tissue fossils? In millions and millions of years, living things that are buried will basically fully mineralize and really have essentially no original material left. And uh, Bob Benyard is going to talk about that, but the information is well available anywhere you turn of original tissue fossils around the world and more being found every day. 
And because the material is identifiable, for example, uh, keratin proteins can be sequenced, then it's really clear to the one who is really looking carefully that it wasn't millions and millions of years that that organism was, was buried. By the way, the word buried, it recognizes that it was a great flood that caused fossils to be placed. We can talk about pseudogenes, that's another topic, but finally, uh, the bottom line says millions of years, genetic entropy says no, and genetic entropy says the genome uh, is, is uh, increasing with more mutations every generation. And that can only happen, it can only continue to happen for a certain period of time. Add to this list uh, carbon-14 in coal uh, and diamonds, the chronometer of, um, of mitochondrial DNA and the acquisition or the increasing load of, of mutations there. And finally, uh, Mendel's accountant is a... Um, it's a beautiful program that has, computer program that has been written by creationists. It would be wonderful for school projects, for kids in school, uh, to have a chance to actually model how population genetics really works. This could have been done by uh, professors at Christian universities to write this kind of software because the population geneticists, secular population geneticists, did not want to write this kind of a program because it wouldn't really support uh, evolution. So you can get this program, Mendel's Accountant. You can find it online someplace and, and use it for your son or your daughter's school project. So here are the points. Yes, Jesus did affirm the Genesis record of creation, the record of the flood as clear and authoritative. Number two, the Jewish hermeneutical principles of Je in the time of Jesus make it very clear when Jesus said, have you not read? It was, he was speaking to the Jewish leaders and they understood what he was saying. Because their, the first principle of the four principles was the first principle of hermeneutics, first look for the clear, open meaning, not a hidden meaning, not a hint, not a relationship uh, kind of thing or a secret meaning. And when Jesus said, have you not read, he was made very clear which principle of hermeneutics they were to apply. And they knew it very well, um, uh, th these principles of understanding. Thirdly, theist uh, theistic evolution is an insidious attack. I'm going to start that over again. Thirdly, theistic evolution is an insidious attack against the being, the nature, the authority of God the Father, and Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have the record of Scripture the God who has made the genome, the God who has made the world and all that is in it, working together, living together, functioning together, is a God who is able to communicate to us what he wants us to understand, and Jesus made that clear. So it's an attack against the authority of God, against his ability to communicate, and it's an attack against Jesus because Jesus, um, he, he said, yeah, that's what it means. So either he misunderstood, his thinking was fuzzy or something. And finally, the Holy Spirit, it's an attack on the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit inspires Scripture. Finally, the solution to the problem, compromised Christian theologians really need to come to know the Jesus of the Bible. Really, it's a time to really come to know the Jesus of the Bible who, who was not just a, a kind of God who emptied himself and, and makes a picture of the eternal God look like a Greek demigod, but he, in fact, was God in the flesh, knowing truth. So that is a Jesus who is not to be rejected but embraced. And when that Jesus, who was God in the flesh, is embraced, then uh, the whole concept of theistic evolution really falls by the wayside. In my understanding, the Jesus that is, if you look under the surface, understood by or held by theistic evolutionists is maybe no little more powerful than, than an icon on the wall surrounded by candles, uh, with a little more power than the, than the icon on the wall to know the past, uh, to know the future, fulfill a promise for the, uh, uh, for the future. Really, ans the answer is for all of us is to really know Jesus, uh, who he is at the very core level of who he truly is. Okay, we'll stop there. <laughs>